60 Great Ghost Stories Read by H. Washington Sawyer Tonight's story, Ghost Stories of the Tiled House by J. S. Lefebvre 1. Old Sally always attended her young mistress while she prepared for bed. Not that Lilith required help, for she had a spirit of neatness and a joyous, gentle alacrity, and only troubled the good old creature enough to prevent her thinking herself grown too old and useless. Sally, in her quiet way, was garrulous, and she had all sorts of old-world tales of wonder and adventure, to which Lilius often went pleasantly to sleep, for there was no danger while old Sally sat knitting there by the fire, and the sound of the old rector's mounting upon his chairs, as was his wont, and taking down and putting up his books in the study beneath, though muffled and faint, gave evidence that that old and loving influence was awake and busy. Old Sally was telling her young mistress, who sometimes listened with a smile, and sometimes lost a good five minutes together, of her gentle prattle, how the young gentleman, Mr. Mivern, had taken that awful, old, haunted habitation, the tiled house, beyond at Bellyfermot, and was going to stay there, and wondered no one had told him of the mysterious dangers of that desolate mansion. It stood by a lonely bend of the narrow road. Lilius had often looked up the short, straight, grass-grown avenue, with an awful curiosity at the old house, which she had learned in childhood to fear as the abode of shadowy tenants and unearthly dangers. There are people, Sally, nowadays, who call themselves free thinkers and don't believe in anything, even in ghosts, said Lilius. Ah, to tend the place is stopping in no, Miss Lily. They'll soon cure him a tree tankin. Half what they say about it is true, answered Sally. But I don't say, mind, he's a three thinker for I don't know anything about Mr. Mervyn, but if he be not, he must be very brave or very good. I know, Sally, I should be horribly afraid indeed to sleep in it myself, answered Lilias, with a cosy little shudder, as the aerial image of the old house for a moment stood before her with its peculiar malign, scared and skulking aspect, as if it had drawn back in shame and guilt among the melancholy old elms and tall hemlocks and nettles. And now, Sally, I'm safe in bed. Stir the fire, my old darling, for although it was the first week in May, the night was frosty. And tell me all about the tiled house again, and frighten me out of my wits. So good old Sally, whose faith in such matters was a religion, went off over the well-known ground in a gentle amble, sometimes subsiding into a walk as she approached some special horror, and pulling up altogether, that is to say, suspending her knitting, and looking with a mysterious nod at her young mistress in the four-poster, or lowering her voice to a whisper, when the crisis came. So she told her how, when the neighbors hired the orchard that ran up to the windows at the back of the old house, the dogs they kept then used to howl so wildly and wolfishly all night among the trees, and prowl under the walls of the house so dejectedly, that they were fain to open the door and let them in at last, and, indeed, small need there was for dogs, for no one, young or old, dared go near the orchard after nightfall. No, the golden pippins that peeped so splendidly through the leaves in the western rays of evening, and made the mouths of the ballyfermot schoolboys water, 
glowed undisturbed in the morning sunbeams, and secure in the mysterious tutelage of the night, smiled coyly on their predatory longings. And this was no fanciful reserve and avoidance. Mick Daly, when he had the orchard, used to sleep in the loft over the kitchen, and he swore that within five or six weeks, while he lodged there, he twice saw the same thing, and that was a lady in a hood and a loose dress, her head drooping and her finger on her lip, walking in silence among the crooked stems, with a little child by the hand, who ran smiling and skipping beside her. And the widow Cresswell once met them at nightfall on the path through the orchard to the back door, and she did not know what it was until she saw the men looking at one another as she told it. It's often she told it to me, said old Sally, and how she came on him all of a sudden at the turn of the path, just by the tick clump of all the trees, how she stopped, thinking it was some lady that had a right to be there, and how they went by as swift as the shadow of a cloud, till she only seemed to be walking slow enough and a little child pulling her by the arm, this way and that way, and took no notice of her, nor even raised her head, till she stopped and curtsied. And old Clinton, don't you remember old Clinton, Miss Lily? I think I do. The old man who limped, and wore an odd black wig? Yes, indeed, Akashla. So he did. See how well she remembers. Tot was by the kick of one of the earl's horses. He was groom ten, resumed Sally. He used to be troubled by the hearing of the very sounds his master used to make to bring him and old Oliver to the door when he came back late. It was only on the very dark nights when there was no moon. They used to hear, all on a sudden, the whimpering and scraping of dogs at the hall door, and the sound of a whistle, and the light stroke across the windy of the lash of a whip, just like as if the earl himself, may his poor soul find rest, was tar. First, to winded stop, like ye'd be old in your breath, then came the sounds they knew so well. And when they made no sign of stirring or opening the door, the wind had begin again with such a hoo hoo hi you'd think it was laughing and crying and hooting all at once. Here old Sally resumed her knitting, suspended for a moment, as if she were listening to the wind outside the haunted precincts of the tiled house. And she took up her parable again. The very night he met his death in London, old Oliver, the butler, was listening to Clinton, for Clinton was a scholar. Reading the letter that came to him through the toast that day, telling him to get things ready, for his troubles were nearly over. And he expected to be with them again in a few days. Maybe almost as soon as the letter. And sure enough, while he was raiding, there came a frightful rattle at the windy, like someone all in a tremble, trying to shake it open, and the earl's voice, as they both conceited, cries from the outside, Let me in! Let me in! Let me in! That's him, says the butler. She's so bad, says Clayton, and they both looked at the windy, and at one another, and then back again, overjoyed and frightened all at once. Old Oliver was bad with a rheumatism in his knee, and went lame like. So away goes Clinton to the old door, and he calls, Who's tar? And no answer. Maybe says Clinton to himself. Tis what is read round to the back door. So to the back door with him. 
and there he shouts again, and no answer, and not a sound outside, and he began to feel queer as to the old door with him back again. Who's tar? Do you hear? Who's tar? He shouts, and receiving no answer still. I'll open the door at any rate, says he. Maybe that's what he's made to escape, for he knew all about his troubles, and wants to get in without noise. So, praying all the time, for his mind misgave him. It might not be all right. He shifts the bars and unlocks the door, but neither man, woman, nor child, nor horse, nor any living shape was standing there. Only something or other slept in the house close by his leg. It might be a dog or something that way. He could not tell, for he only seen for a moment with the corner of his eye. And it went in just like as if it belonged to the place. He could not see what it was that went, up or down, but the house was never a happy one or a queer house after. And Clinton banged the old door and he took a sort of turn and trembling and back with him to Oliver, the butler, looking as white as a blank leaf on his master's letter was fluttering between his finger and thumb. What is that? What is that? says the butler, catching his crutch like a weapon, fastening his eyes on Clinton's white face and growing almost as pale himself. The master's dead, says Clinton. And so he was, signs on it. After the turn she got by what she seen in the orchard, when she came to know the truth of what it was, Ginny Criswell, you may be sure, did not stay there any longer than she could help, and she began to take notice of things that she did not mind before, such as when she went to the big bedroom over the hall and she lured used to sleep in. Whenever she went in by one door, the other door would be pulled to very quick, as if someone avoiding her was getting out in haste. But the thing that frightened her the most was this, that sometimes she used to find a long straight mark from the head to the foot of her bed, as if it was made by something had been lying there, and the place where it used to feel warm, as if, whoever it was, they only left it as she came into the room. But the worst of all was poor Kitty Halpin, the young woman that died of what she seen. Her mother said it was how she was kept awake all night by the walking about of someone in the next room, stumbling about boxes and pulling open drawers, and talking and saying to himself, and she, poor Tang, wishing to go to sleep, and wondering who it could be, when in he comes, a fine man, in a sort of loose silk morning dress, with no wig, but a velvet cap on, and to the windy with him, quiet and easy, and she makes a turn in the bed, to let him know that there was someone in her, thinking he'd go away, but instead of that, or he comes to the side of the bed, looking very bad, and says something to her. But his speech is as thick and queer, like a dummy's. Dad had been trying to speak, and she grew very frightened, and says she, I ask your honour's pardon, sir, but I can't hear you right. And with that, he stretches out his neck, high out of his cravat, turning his face up towards the ceiling, and grace between us an arm. His throat was cut across like another mouth wide open, laughing at her. She seen no more, but dropped in a dead faint in a bed, and back to her murder in the morning. And she never swallowed bit nor sup more, only she just sat by the fire, holding her mother's hand, 
crying and trembling and peeping o'er her shoulder and starting at every sound till she took the fever and died, parting not five weeks after. And so on and on and on flowed the stream of old Sally's narrative while Lilius dropped into dreamless sleep and then the storyteller stole away to her own tidy bedroom and innocent slumbers. 2. I'm sure she believed every word she related, for old Sally was voracious. But all this was worth just so much as such talk it commonly is, marvels, fabulae, what our ancestors call winter's tales, which gather details from every narrator and dilated in the act of narration. Still, it was not quite for nothing that the house was held to be haunted. Under all the smoke there smoldered just a little spark of truth, an authenticated mystery for the solution of which some of my readers may possibly suggest a theory, though I confess I can't. Miss Rebecca Chattisworth, in the letter dated late in the autumn of 1753, gives a minute and curious relation of the occurrences in the tiled house, which, it is plain, although at starting she protests against all such fooleries, she has heard with a peculiar sort of interest, and relates it certainly with an awful sort of particularity. I was for printing the entire letter, which is really very singular as well as characteristic, but my publisher meets me with his veto, and I believe he is right. The worthy old lady's letter is, perhaps, too long. I must rest content with a few hungry notes of its tenor. That year, and somewhere about the 24th of October, there broke out a strange dispute between Mr. Alderman Harper of High Street, Dublin, and my lord, Castle Mallard, who, in virtue of his cousinship to the young heir's mother, had undertaken for him the management of the tiny estate on which the tiled, or tiled house, for I find it spelt both ways, stood. This alderman, Harper, had agreed for a lease of the house for his daughter, who was married to a gentleman named Prosser. He furnished it and put up hangings, and otherwise went to considerable expense. Mr. and Mrs. Prosser came there to live some time in June, and after having parted with a good many servants in the interval, she made up her mind that she could not live in the house, and that her father waited on Lord Castle Mallard and told him plainly that he would not take out the lease because the house was subjected to annoyances which he could not explain. In plain terms, he said it was haunted, and that no servants would live there more than a few weeks, and that after that, what his son-in-law's family had suffered there, not only should he be excused from taking the lease of it, but that the house itself ought to be pulled down as a nuisance and the habitual haunt of something worse than human malefactors. Lord Castle Mallard filed a bill in the equity side of the exchequer to compel Mr. Alderman Harper to perform his contract by taking out the lease. But the alderman drew an answer supported by no less than seven long affidavits, copies of all which were furnished to his lordship, and with the desired effect, for rather than compel him to place them upon the file of the court, his lordship struck and consented to release him. I am sorry the cause did not proceed at least far enough to place upon the records of the court the very authentic and unaccountable story which Miss Rebecca relates. The annoyances described did not begin until the end of August, when, one evening, Mrs. Prosser, quite alone, was sitting in the twilight at the back parlor window, which was open, looking out into the orchard, and plainly saw a hand stealthily placed upon the stone window sill outside, as if by some one beneath the window at her right side intending to climb up. 
There was nothing but the hand, which was rather short, but handsomely formed, and white and plump, laid on the edge of the window sill. And it was not a very young hand, but one aged, somewhere above forty, as she conjectured. It was only a few weeks before that that the horrible robbery at Clondalkin had taken place, and the lady fancied that the hand was that of one of the miscreants who was now about to scale the windows of the tiled house. She uttered a loud scream with an ejaculation of terror, and at the same moment the hand was quietly withdrawn. Search was made in the orchard but there were no indications of any persons having been under the window, beneath which, ranged along the wall, stood a great column of flower-pots, which it seemed must have prevented anyone's coming within reach of it. The same night there came a hasty tapping, every now and then, at the window of the kitchen. The women grew frightened, and the serving-man, taking firearms with him, opened the back door, but discovered nothing. As he shut it, however, he said, A tump came on it, and a pressure as if someone striving to force his way in, which frightened him. And though the tapping went on upon the kitchen window panes, he made no further explorations. About six o'clock on Sunday evening, the cook, an honest, sober woman, now aged nigh sixty years, being alone in the kitchen, saw, on looking up, it is supposed, the same fat but aristocratic-looking hand laid with its palm against the glass near the side of the window, and this time moving slowly up and down, pressed all the while against the glass, as if feeling carefully for some inequality in its surface. She cried out and said something like a prayer on seeing it, but it was not withdrawn for several seconds after. After this, for a great many nights, there came at first a low, and afterwards an angry rapping, as if it seemed with some set of clenched knuckles at the back door. And the servant-man would not open it, but called to know who was there, and there came no answer, but only a sound as if the palm of a hand was placed against it, and drawn slowly from side to side, with a sort of soft, groping motion. All this time, sitting in the back parlour, which for time they used as a drawing-room, Mr. and Mrs. Prosser were disturbed by rappings at the window, sometimes very low and furtive, like a clandestine signal, and at others sudden and so loud as to threaten the breaking of the pane. This was all at the back of the house, which looked upon the orchard, as you know. But on a Tuesday night, at about half-past nine, there came precisely the same rapping at the hall door, and went on, to the great annoyance of the master and terror of his wife, at intervals for nearly two hours. After this, for several days and nights, they had no annoyance whatsoever, and began to think that the nuisance had expended itself. But on the night of the 13th of September, Jane Esterbrook, an English maid, having gone into the pantry for a small silver bowl in which her mistress's posset was served, happening to look up at the little window of only four panes, observed through an auger hole which was drilled through the window frame for the admission of a bolt to secure the shutter, a white pudgy finger, first the tip, and then the two first joints introduced, and turned about this way and that, crooked against the inside, as if in search of a fastening which his owner designed to push aside. When the maid got back to the kitchen, we are told she fell into a swoon, and was all the next day very weak. Mr. Prosser, being, I've heard, a hard-headed and conceited sort of fellow, scouted the ghost and sneered at the fears of his family. He was privately of the opinion that the whole affair was a practical joke or fraud, and waited an opportunity of catching the rogue flagrante delicto.
He did not long keep his theory to himself, but let it out by degrees, with no stint of oaths and threats, believing that some domestic traitor held the thread of the conspiracy. Indeed, it was time something were done, for not only his servants, but the good Mrs. Prosser herself had grown to look unhappy and anxious, and kept at home from the hour of sunset, and would not venture about the house after nightfall, except in couples. The knocking had ceased for about a week, and one night, Mrs. Prosser being in the nursery, her husband, who was in the parlor, heard it begin very softly at the hall door. The air was quite still, which favored his hearing distinctly. This was the first time there had been any disturbance on that side of the house, and the character of the summons also was changed. Mr. Prosser, leaving the parlor door open, it seems, went quietly into the hall. The sound was that of beating on the outside of the stout door, softly and regularly, with the flat of the hand. He was going to open it suddenly, but changed his mind, and went back very quickly on to the head of the kitchen stair, where there was a strong closet over the pantry in which he kept his firearms, swords, and canes. Here he called his serving man, whom he believed to be honest, and with a pair of loaded pistols in his own coat pockets, and giving another pair to him, he went down as lightly as he could followed by the man, and with a stout walking cane in his hand, forward to the door. Everything went as Mr. Prosser wished. The besieger of his house, so far from taking flight at his approach, grew more impatient, and the sort of patting which had roused his attention at first assumed the rhythm and emphasis of a series of double knocks. Mr. Prosser, angry, opened the door with his right arm across, cane in hand. Looking, he saw nothing, but his arm was jerked up oddly, as it might be with the hollow of a hand, and something passed under it with a kind of gentle squeeze. The servant neither saw nor felt anything, but did not know why his master looked back so hastily and shut the door with so sudden a slam. From that time, Mr. Prosser discontinued his angry talk and swearing about it, and seemed nearly as adverse from the subject as the rest of his family. He grew, in fact, very uncomfortable, feeling an inward persuasion that when, in answer to the summons, he had opened the hall door, he had actually given admission to the besieger. He said nothing to Mrs. Prosser, but went up earlier to his bedroom, where he read for a while in his Bible and said his prayers. I hope the particular relation of this circumstance does not indicate its singularity. He lay awake a good while, it appears, and as he supposed, about a quarter past twelve, he heard the soft palm of a hand patting the outside of the bedroom door, and then brush slowly along it. Up bounced Mr. Prosser, very much frightened, and locked the door, crying, Who's there? But receiving no answer, but the same brushing sound of a soft hand drawn over the panels, which he knew only too well. In the morning, the housemaid was terrified by the impression of a hand in the dust of the little parlor table, where they had been unpacking Delft and other things the day before. The print of the naked foot on the sea sand did not frighten Robinson Crusoe half so much. They were by this time all nervous, and some of them half crazed about the hand. Mr. Prosser went to examine the mark and made light of it, but, as he swore afterwards, rather to quiet his servants than from any comfortable feeling about it in his own mind. However, he had them all, one by one, into the room, and made each place his or her hand palm downward on the same table, thus making a similar impression from every person in the house, including himself and his wife, 
and his affidavit deposed that the formation of the hands so impressed differed altogether from those of the living inhabitants of the house and corresponded exactly with that of the hand seen by Mrs. Prosser and by the cook. Whoever or whatever the owner of the hand might be, they all felt this subtle demonstration to mean that it was declared he was no longer out of doors, but had established himself in the house. And now Mrs. Prosser began to be troubled with strange and horrible dreams, some of which, as set out in detail in Aunt Rebecca's long letter, are really very appalling nightmares. But one night, as Mr. Prosser closed his bedchamber door, he was struck somewhat by the utter silence of the room, there being no sound of breathing, which seemed unaccountable to him, as he knew his wife was in bed, and his ears were particularly sharp. There was a candle burning on the small table at the foot of the bed, beside the one he held in his one hand, a heavy ledger connected with his father-in-law's business being under his arm. He drew the curtain at the side of the bed and saw Mrs. Prosser lying, as for a few seconds he was mortally feared, dead, her face being motionless, white, and covered with a cold dew, and on the pillow, close beside her head, and just within the curtains, was the same white, fattish hand, with the wrist resting on the pillow, and the fingers extended toward her temple with a slow, wavy motion. Mr. Prosser, with a horrified jerk, pitched the ledger straight at the curtains behind which the owner of the hand might be supposed to stand. The hand was instantaneously and smoothly snatched away. The curtains made a great wave, and Mr. Prosser got around the bed in time to see the closet door, which was at the other side, drawn close by the same white, puffy hand, as he believed. He drew the door open with a fling and stared in, but the closet was empty, except for the clothes hanging from the pegs on the wall, and the dressing table and looking glass facing the windows. He shut it sharply and locked it, and felt for a minute, he says, as if he were like to lose his wits. Then, ringing the bell, he brought the servants, and with much ado they recovered Mrs. Prosser from a sort of trance in which, he says, from her looks, she seemed to have suffered the pains of death. And Aunt Rebecca adds, From what she told me of her visions, with her own lips, he might have added, and of hell also. But the occurrence which seems to have determined the crisis was the strange sickness of their eldest child, a little girl aged between two and three years. It lay awake, seemingly in paroxysms of terror, and the doctors who were called in set down the symptoms to incipient water on the brain. Mrs. Prosser used to sit up with the nurse by the nursery fire, much troubled in mind about the condition of her child. Its bed was placed sideways along the wall, with its head against the door of a press or cupboard, which, however, did not quite close. There was a little valance, about a foot deep, around the top of the child's bed, and this descended within some ten or twelve inches of the pillow on which it lay. They observed that the little creature was quieter whenever they took it up and held it in their laps. They had just replaced it, as it seemed to have grown quite sleepy and tranquil, but it was not five minutes in its bed when it began to scream in one of its frenzies of terror, and the same moment the nurse for the first time detected, and Mrs. Prosser equally plainly saw, following the direction of her eyes, the real cause of the child's sufferings. Protruding through the aperture of the press, and shrouded in the shade of the valance, they plainly saw the white, fat hand, palm downwards, 
presented towards the head of the child. The mother uttered a scream and snatched the child from its little bed, and she and the nurse ran down to the lady's sleeping room, where Mr. Prosser was in bed, shutting the door as they entered, and they had hardly done so when a gentle tap came to it from the outside. There was a great deal more, but this will suffice. The singularity of the narrative seems to me to be this, that it describes the ghost of a hand, and no more. The person to whom that hand belonged never once appeared, nor was it a hand separated from a body, but only a hand so manifested and introduced that its owner was always, by some crafty accident, hidden from view. In the year 1819, at a college breakfast, I met a Mr. Prosser, a thin, grave, but rather chatty old gentleman, with very white hair, drawn back into a pigtail, and he told us all, with a concise particularity, a story of his cousin, James Prosser, who, when an infant, had slept for some time in what his mother said was a haunted nursery in an old house near Chapel Isid, and who, whenever he was ill, over-fatigued, or in any way feverish, suffered all through his life as he had done from the time he could scarce remember, from a vision of a certain gentleman, fat and pale, every curl of whose wig, every button and fold of whose laced clothes, every feature and line of whose sensual, malignant, and unwholesome face, was as minutely engraven upon his memory as the dress and lineaments of his father's portrait which hung before him every day at breakfast, dinner, and supper. Mr. Prosser mentioned this as an instance of a curious, monotonous, individualized, and persistent nightmare, and hinted that the extreme horror and anxiety with which his cousin, of whom he spoke in the past tense as, Poor Jimmy! was at any time induced to mention it. I hope the reader will pardon me for loitering so long in the tiled house, but this sort of lure has always had a charm for me, and people you know, especially old people, will talk of what most interests themselves, too often forgetting that others may have had more than enough of it.